Once again, welcome everyone to Word Addiction. Today, by God's grace, we are going to read through the book of Isaiah, chapters number 5, all through to chapters number 8. And I believe that it's going to be a wonderful time in God's presence as, as God speaks to us through his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and we honor you today. We say that King of Glory, how we are delighted just to be in your presence and to read through the book of Isaiah today. Lord, I know that there is so much that is in store for us. How I pray that your Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of understanding, the spirit of revelation, shall be with us today uh, as we just read through the word to communicate to us the revelation, the insight according to your word, King of glory. We honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, we do trust, pray, and believe. Amen. Isaiah chapter number 5, verses 1. Now, let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to do what? To bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. So here we see uh, this um, analogy of uh, that God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he wants the people to know that there was uh, the story between a beloved and his vineyard. And actually, the beloved himself is God, and the vineyard is um, the nation of Israel. And so he's using this analogy to try and tell them, to show them the kind of disappointment that he has. In the same manner that the beloved, you know, set up a vineyard, gave everything that, he, that, that, that you can give to make a vineyard produce for you. The kind of disappointment a farmer has. You know, a person who has invested in a vineyard has, if it does not bring back, it is the same disappointment that Jehovah God, the God of Israel, has against Israel. So he says he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And this shows you something about our relationship with God, that when God has called you, when you are born again, remember the story, um, the, the, the parable of um, uh, the, the vineyard, uh, uh, the vine and the branches, and the, and the vine dresser, which is in John chapter number 15, the intention that God has with a relationship with you is not only to take you to heaven, but he wants you to be fruitful here on earth. And so God is saying, this beloved, which is God himself, has brought up or has established a vineyard, put up a tower there. And that tower actually represents his name, represents his house. So he has put a tower there. He has given everything he can give for this vineyard, for it to produce, but it falls short. By doing not, the expectation that God has for it, they do this, it brings forth wild grapes. Things that are not, I mean, a fruit that is not used, a fruit that is not profitable, a fruit that is degraded. It is, it's not the quality of which the vine, the vine owner or the vine uh, investor expects to get back. And most of our time in our, in our walk with God, we find ourselves there. Remember, God wants you to bear much fruit. And the only way you can bear much fruit is by interacting, being intimate, growing in love with him, understanding him, staying in his word, putting his word in your heart and letting the word of God instruct you in the ways of righteousness, instruct you when it comes to relationship, instruct you in the decisions that you make. For out of those decisions, the outcome of your life will be determined whether it is good or bad. But when you use God's word, it bears good fruit. When you use the standards of men, it bears wild grapes. And we shall see it. Verses 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard, he says. What more could have been done to my vineyard 
that I have not done in it. Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please, he says, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its age, that is protection, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, and it shall be pruned or dug. It shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up uh, briars and thorns, and also command the clouds that they, may, that they rain no more on it. Meaning they will no longer have protection. They'll be uprooted. The rain will not be commanded, which is a blessing. The source of making the vineyard, you know, sprout and grow. No, no, no. God says, judge between me and the vineyard. See the kind of input I have put in it. And you know, some of us will say, wow, what a story. How can this vineyard, you know, lack to produce? But you know, that's the same case with us believers. Most of us, God has given us everything through Jesus Christ to make us fruitful, to make us grow, to make us dominate, gain back our dominion here on earth to declare his kingdom here, to declare his presence here, and, you know, to walk in continuous victory over the forces of darkness. But what has happened? There are a lot of believers who live in fear. People who see cockroaches in their house and believe they are demons. And they are afraid of them. And they need extra exorcism. Why? Because we have lacked our identity. We no longer know our authority. We no longer know the price that Christ prayed for you to walk in victory. And you know, all these you know, things that happen that make us so afraid of the enemy. God looks at us and he judges us and he wonders, I have given you everything. Ephesians 1.3 says, The blessed be our God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. It's not just cars as people want to believe it. When we talk about spiritual blessings, we are talking about the authority that makes you produce in this earthly life by divine enablement. A lot of believers don't understand who they are. They don't understand the place that God has called them. They don't understand his purpose over their lives. So people live blindly. I want to pray that you shall not be an unfruitful vineyard, that you shall not make you shall not fall of the expectation that God has placed upon you. You are a daughter and a son of destiny, made for signs and for wonders. May you realize that purpose. May you realize your place and your position in the kingdom of God. And above all, may you bear fruit according to what God expects in you. Remember this, God has invested so much in you and me to remain failures, to remain fearful, to remain stagnant, to experience constant delays. It is not our portion. May we arise with the expectation of God, walk in his love, adore his word, put it into practice and let it bear fruit according to God's expectation, not according to man's expectation. Why? Because the expectation of man is low. The expectation of God is high. The standards of man are low. The standards of God are high. If you live your life towards, you know, the target, which is God's expectation, your life will bear much fruit than you ever think. Don't settle for the dictates of man. Look unto what God has called you to become and pursue it with all that you have. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the reality. Don't try to chase a dream without God. Don't try to chase a purpose without God. Don't try to fulfill a destiny without seeking intimacy with God because you will fail and you will get frustrated. Submit yourself in a love relationship with God. Remember we say this and over again. If you want to experience, if you want to experience God in your life, you must realize that God calls you to pursue a love relationship with him that is personal and that it is real. He says this, For the vineyard of the Lord, verse 7, of host is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, 
but behold, what did he see? Oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field, till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land, in the hearing of the Lord of hosts said, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. Imagine a whole ten acres of vineyard being pressed will only yield 22 liters. Just 22 liters. That's just one bath. Just 22 liters. One bath is 22 liters actually. So he says, imagine 10 good acres of vine will give so little yield. Why? Because when you are separated from God, when you're just separated from God, your level of production reduces here on earth. You may increase in wealth, but for the kingdom of God, the purposes of which God called you to have an impact here on earth in terms of driving God's kingdom, God's agenda, you will produce very little. Why? Because you've been detached from the source. You are not fully connected to the source. You know, which, which, which when, you, when you look at it uh, from this aspect of John chapter number 15, Jesus Christ says, I am the true vine. You are the branches. The Father is the gardener. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, what will happen? You'll produce fruit. So the extent of our productivity is, is related to our connectivity to the vine. So if you're not connected to the vine, you will produce so little or nothing at all. What to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them, the harp and the strings, the tambourine and the flute, and wine are in their feasts but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operations of his hand. You know, when we are talking about, when you are reading the book of um, Psalms, I kept on, you know, digging and saying, please, one of the things that stops us believers from moving forward is having a lack of God consciousness. And he says that these people lack a consciousness of God because they have been given to wine and intoxicating drinks. Listen, there is a correlation between intoxicating drinks and being God conscious. That's why Ephesians 5.18, we said this. The Bible keeps on telling us, do not be drunk in wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because wine has an influence. The Holy Spirit has an influence. If you take wine, if you get intoxicated, you will be led towards a certain direction, which will be far and far away from being God conscious. Why? Because that's what wine will do. And when you get connected to the Holy Spirit, it draws you, you know, that connection draws you more and more deeply into a love relationship with God and you walk with the consciousness of God. Now, these people, because they've been given to intoxicate in drink, what happens? They do not regard the work of God. They are not God conscious. Nor do they consider the operations of his hand. I pray that all of us will come to a point whereby we will pursue this love relationship with God that is so real, that is so personal, that we will be so God conscious. You know, there are people who never walk with testimonies. They never see God operating in their own lives. 
And you know, if you want, really want to walk with God and have an experience with God, you must be God conscious. You must be conscious of the fact that God is working around you and he wants you to join in the work that he does. And it can only come when you begin to initiate a love relationship with God that is personal and that it is real. Verses 13. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity, he says, because they have no knowledge. His people have gone to captivity for the due fact that they have no knowledge. They have no understanding. Their ignorance has made them captive. And when you look at this, I said, a lot of us are afflicted by demons. A lot of us are afflicted by Satan, not because he's powerful, but because ignorance has ruled their lives. When you are ignorant of your position in Christ, the enemy has, you know, what do we call it? Uh, he has an open door in your life to afflict you, to cause you to become a failure, to make you afraid. Remember, over and over, as you've been reading the scriptures and will continue to read, if there is something that God wants his people, is that don't be afraid. Why? Because a person who is God conscious understands who they are. And fear will not become your portion. He tells Joshua, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And if you realize this, Joshua, then don't be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Do not be discouraged. For as I was with Moses, I shall be with you. Go and take the territories. Every place your foot, foot shall trend upon, I shall give it to you. And these children of Israel, as an inheritance, as he promised their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you get afraid, it means that you have no reality of your relationship with God. You know, remember years ago we went um, for a mission in some place in the eastern part of this nation. And when we went there, you know, mission field is a battleground all over. If I tell people, <laughs> if, you, if you doubt God, if you doubt that God actually moves, if you doubt that God is in the agenda of the supernatural, get into the mission field. That place, you know, is a constant battlefield. And we were young then in our, I think in our early 20s. And as we went for this mission in this place, um, there was a lot of power encounters there. And it is a village where we've got a lot of... Uh, witch doctors or herbalists or uh, I don't know how you call them. And um, I remember there's a time that um, we were resting and actually it was in a church. Eh? We, were, we, were, we, were, we were settled in a church. And the evil spirits were sent there, let me tell you. And uh, there was so much turmoil. There was people were being... Um, you know, pulled out from where they are sleeping, literally. Literally, they were being pulled out and blankets were being taken out. You know, we were sleeping and it is, I don't know how to explain that. But in the midst of it, for two days it continues, it continued actually for two days and we were with a series of uh, uh, young believers then. We, are, we had gone to train them in the mission field. And so, one of the days, somebody, one of those uh, young people come and asks me, why don't you get disturbed by these things? I remember we were with Pastor Victor, who's uh, a part of our um, apostolic council at Life Pool Chapel uh, churches. And we told them, this is our secret. When we come to the mission, number one, we've prepared. When we come to the mission, we understand our position there. We understand our position uh, there. And, you know, I went and told them, do you know what the Bible says in the book of um, uh, Colossians? Uh, it says simple, that we are hidden with Christ. We are hidden together with Christ in God. And so he says to them, this is the consciousness that I walk in. The enemy cannot be permitted to come and terrorize my life as long as I'm united with Christ in the umbrella of God. And I've walked through that. And, you know, uh, at the end of that, you know, we just prayed with them. 
because first actually we thought that it's just some hula baloo and hysteria. But when he said, you know what, let's take our place. We joined hands, we declared our position in Christ, and we had the best coming. You know, we were there for uh, seven days. For the next five days, we had total peace in pursuing God's agenda. And out of that mission, we had, I think, 126 people getting born again, and two of which were witch doctors. You know, by just understanding who you are in Christ, it grants you victory over forces of darkness. It grants you victory over the forces of darkness. I pray that all of us will come to a position of realizing and understanding the place that we have in Christ uh, Jesus. Their unhonorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth. Beyond measure, their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down. Each man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lambs shall feed in their pasture, and in the waste places of the fast of the fat ones, of the fat ones, strangers shall eat. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sing as if with a cut rope. That say, Let him make speed and haste his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel. Draw near and come that we may know it. What to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What to those who are wise in their own eyes, he says, and prudent in their own sight. Does God have a problem with us being wise? No. But he wants our ways, our wisdom to be consistent to his word. Not in our own eyes, because that's pride. But when we understand that wisdom, the wisdom, because there are very there are many levels of wisdom, by the way. There are very le many levels of wisdom. But our wisdom should find its anchor in God's word. Our wisdom should be inspired by the Spirit of God, is the Spirit of wisdom. And saying that I am proud in my own eyes, thinking that I've accomplished this because of my own wisdom, it profits nothing. Before God says, woe unto you who thinks they are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. What to men mighty at drinking wine, what to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drinks, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flames consume the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust. Because they have rejected the Lord, underline that, because they have rejected the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills tremble. The carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all, is ang for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out. Still, he will lift up a banner to the nations from afar. He will whistle to them from the ends of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt of their loins be loosed, 
nor the strap of their sandals be broken. Whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bend. Their horses' hooves will seem like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring will be like a lion and they will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. They will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. In that day, they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened by the clouds. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another, uh, and one uh, cried to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. You know, Isaiah has this, um, what do we call it? Encounter, divine encounter, you know, with the spiritual realm. And it is, it dates it to when uh, King Uzziah died. You know, and um, people think that actually that Isaiah was, was prophesying without having a divine encounter. It is not so. It's only that in chapters number six, he tells them of how he came to become, of how he came to become a prophet in the nation of Israel. And he's trying to tell them, I date this back to the year that King Uzziah died. You know, in that moment, there is something that happened in my life that gave me a divine encounter that changed the person that I am. I saw the Lord. I saw, you know, I, I have an encounter and I saw the Lord seated on his throne, seraphims here, you know, two of them. And he says, one of them says, this holy, holy is the Lord God, for the whole earth is filled with his glory. You know, it's dated back to Uzziah because Uzziah, Uzziah actually was a first cousin to Isaiah the prophet. So it was a personal loss for, for Isaiah. And in that loss, in the moment of mourning, in the moment of uh, losing a loved one, a close relative, the Lord appears to him. He has a divine encounter. And what have we read in the book of, uh, is it Psalms? That no, God is close to those who are brokenhearted. So in this moment, he has a divine encounter. And he sees the Lord's glory. And the angels tell him, listen, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And his glory has filled the whole earth. And I was reading these scriptures the other day and I was asking myself, how come the glory of God fills the entire earth, but people don't realize it? People don't realize it. That the glory of God is here with us. It fills the entire earth, but we are oblivious of it. Many people are oblivious of it. We have been put a veil. A lot of believers have been put veils in their eyes that they cannot see the glory of God that actually fills the earth. And people have made a choice to say, do you know what? I don't believe God exists. I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. And that has been the story of a lot of people. That's why I'm praying so much that as we read the Bible, that we will become conscious of God's presence around us. There is nothing as sudden in us that that will live without understanding that the glory of God actually is around us. We are in the glory of God. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the, highs, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, What is me? For I am undone, because I am a man who, who I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. A divine encounter reveals not only God, but it reveals you. So when Isaiah had this divine encounter, 
He saw the glory of God. He saw the seraphims. And then he had a reflection to it. He was now conscious of himself. And he discovered, do you know what? I am undone. For what reason? I have unclean lips. Living amongst a people with unclean lips. Then one of the seraphims sorry, flew to him. Uh, to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sins purged. He said, The Lord Jesus Christ died on, on the cross for our sins. So it is the blood of Christ that takes away our sins. Now here the Bible says that one of the seraphims took a coal, that's fire, and put it upon you know, the lips of um, Isaiah to cleanse him. What, is the, what does the fire represent when it comes to the New Testament? It represents the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ says, John, uh, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water, but one who is greater than I is coming. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? The work of the Holy Spirit is to bring forth sanctification. How does this happen? When you are in a relationship with the Holy Spirit and you stay in the word of God, the Holy Spirit uses the word of God as a tool of sanctification in your life. That's why I say it is so important for every believer to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. To pursue that fellowship with the Holy Spirit that we say when we, call, when we declare the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God. And that's with fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be always with you. That's what God intends for all of us. To have a relationship with him. To the person of the Holy Spirit. He brings sanctification. Is the one who prepares us for ministry. Is the one who reveals to us the will of God, the purposes of God, the assignments of God in our lives. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell these people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of these people dull and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, let, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. So he tells them, this is the assignment. These people who keep on seeing, but they do not actually see, keep on hearing, but they don't actually hear, go and give them the news of doom. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid west and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly destroyed. And the Lord has removed men far away and forsaken the places, and forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be, will return I, but yet a tenth will be in it and will return and for consuming and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remalia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz. You and Shia, Jashub, your son, at the end of the, uh, of the uh, aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway of the, of the fuller's field, and said to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be disheartened. For these two stabs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of raising, 
and Syria and the son of Ramalia, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it. And let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. Thus says the Lord God. It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. With 65 years, Ephraim, within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. He says, these are the things that will happen. These are the things that will happen. But listen, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. You looked at this when you were looking at Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles 2020. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe in his prophets and so shall you be, shall you prosper. You know, if you ever want the word of God to be established in your life, you must engage faith. You must believe. You must set your heart to accept what God says as the absolute truth and that is something that will come to happen. Remember Numbers 23, 19? Uh, you know, uh, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. As he not said it, shall he not fulfill it? You must fix, you must actually mix, sorry, not fix, mix God's word with faith for it to produce in your life. When we come to study the book of Hebrews, you'll see that those who did not enter into their promise because they did not mix the word that they received with faith. If you ever want to enter into God's promises, because there are a lot of people who are, we are in the age where, you know, a lot of prophecies are coming up and there are things that God will have spoken over your life. But if you don't believe it, it will not be established. And many people will believe that God is a liar, that prophet is a liar. But where is the place of faith? Put your trust and your hope in what God says, and it will be established in your life. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for, um, from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depths or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So here God comes and he says, Do you know what, heirs? Ask me of anything. I love it in the message. Uh, yeah, is it in the message translation that says, ask anything, ask for the moon. I think it's the message translation that says that. Ask even for the moon. It says, ask for a sign. Let me tell you, a virgin shall give birth. What other sign is there? It says, ask of me. Let me tell you what will happen. You think I don't have the ability to do great things? Listen, this is what will happen. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which actually means God with us. Cards and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria. He says, before this happens, the land shall be forgotten or shall be forsaken uh, by their kings. And you know, this is actually a messianic prophet. He talks, uh, the virgin, he talks about the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he says, before this happens, the land shall be forsaken by its own kings. And what will happen? The Lord will bring in the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house. Days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle uh, for the fly uh, that is in the father's 
part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria that will come to sting. To sting. They will come, and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the cleft of the rocks. And all thorns and, and in all pastures. In the same day, the Lord will shave with the hired razor. With those from, be, from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and will also remove the beard. It shall be in that day that a man will keep alive a, a young cow and two sheep. So it shall be from the abundance of milk they give that he will eat cards. For cards and honey everyone will eat who is left in the land. It shall happen in that day that wherever there could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it will be for prayers and thorns. It shall be actually worthless. With arrows and bows, men will come there because all the land will become briars and thorns. And to any hill which could be dug in the hole, you will not go there for fear and briars and thorns. And it will become a range for oxen and a place for sheep to roam. However, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hash Bahaz. And I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of uh, Jerebakiah, Jeberekiah. Then I went to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name. Maher Shalal, Hash Baz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my mother and my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus, the spoil of Samaria, will be taken away before the king of Assyria. The Lord also spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch as these people refused, to wa the waters of Shiloh that flow softly re and rejoice in Rezin and in Remalia's son. Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory. He will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah it will overflow uh, over Judah. It will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. It will pass through Judah. It will overflow and pass over. It will reach up to the next and the stretching out of his wings. And will feel the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Be shattered, O people, O you peoples, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from countries. Guard yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Guard yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Take counsels together, but it will come to nothing. Don't try and scheme. Don't try and consult. Because whatever plans you have, they'll come to rot. Speak the word, but it will, be, it will not stand. For God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of his people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that his people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Hallow him. Respect him. Honor him. He will be a sanctuary. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many amongst them shall do what? They shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken 
Be snared and taken. To the people who fear God is a strong tower, is a sense of sanctuary. But the people who abhor him, they shall stumble. They shall, they, they shall come to nothing. Bind up the testimony, seal the law amongst my people, and I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob. And I hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. And align the next verse. The next word, it says, we are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. The people who trust him, in him, they find a sanctuary. The people who don't trust him, they shall be destroyed. Then he says, but as for me and my sons, we shall be for signs and for wonders. As for me and my sons, we shall be for signs and for wonders. We shall be as monuments. You shall see what it means when God decides to do something or to be attached to a people who, are, who have trusted in him. And I pray that over my children every single morning and every single night. Before they, before they go to bed and before they go to school. I declare that over their lives. I say, my daughters, guess what? You are made for signs and for wonders. You are daughters of destiny, made for signs and for wonders. And I pray that as they grow up, you know, that's what will actually happen. I am praying that they shall be monuments of God's glory and God's operations and God's doing on this earth. Why? Because God has blessed you. And let the generations that come after you be also blessed. But you have to declare over them. You must shape them with God's word. You must be a prophet over the lives of the next generations that come after you. And when they say to you, seek those who are medians and wizards, who, uh, who, uh, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, because there is no revelation. That's why people seek for diviners. That's why people seek for wizards. Why? Because there is no revelation. There is no insight. There is no inspiration. Shall you go to seek the living on behalf of the dead? Instead of seeking God on behalf of the living, people do that because they lack no rev they lack revelation. Verses twenty one, they will pass through it hard pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged, enraged, and curse their king and their God. Look upward, then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. For where there is no revelation, people are destroyed. Where there is no vision, people are destroyed. Where there is no revelation, people cast off all restraint, and they are forced to get into destruction. God has already given us revelation. But for you to access it in a personal dimension, you must be given to pursue after it. God has given all things freely, but it will cost you your energies to attain them. God has given us free. You don't need to pay for revelation. Christ paid that price. The Holy Spirit is here, but it will take you time to say, do you know what? I'm switching off the screens. I'm putting away my phone. I know you have beautiful phones. I know you've got following on WhatsApp and Instagram and TikTok and said, you know what? For the next few days, I'm sitting aside to get the revelation that pertains to the excellence of my life, to the pursuit of my destiny, to the fulfillment of my assignment. If we lack that, our lives will be destroyed. I said this and I'll say it over and over again. There is a conspiracy by the underworld. There is a conspiracy by the enemy to frustrate the children of God and bring them into destruction and poverty. The only way we will escape that is by receiving divine instructions and divine revelation that will put you above the agenda of the enemy against believers. 
May that be your portion. May you seek a drive to seek after God. May you hear what he says. There, are, there is a destiny set for you. There is a revelation that will set you apart. May you receive it and gain it in Jesus' name. See you tomorrow, same time, same place. May the Lord watch over you and keep you in perfect peace. Shalom.